Hi, I'm Willie Prado, President of the Society for Prevention Research, and I'd like to welcome you to SPR's 2020 virtual conference. I hope that wherever you're participating from in this virtual conference, that you and your loved ones are healthy and safe. All of us on the Board of Directors may seeing everyone in Washington, D.C. this past May. We know that this virtual conference doesn't truly replace our in-person meeting, where we can exchange thoughts and engage in thought-provoking conversations during lunch, breaks, or even down the halls of the hotel. But the SPR Board of Directors felt strongly that SPR must continue to fulfill its mission in the face of COVID-19. After all, at no time in our modern history has prevention and public health been more prominent than it is today. This is an opportunity for all of us in prevention to bring attention to this field, to advance science and to let the science guide our practices and help influence our policies. It is also our responsibility to pursue racial justice and to act now to reduce health disparities and achieve health equity for all, particularly for Blacks who continue to face systemic racism and discrimination. The goal of SPR's annual meeting is to provide a unique opportunity to advance the vision of SPR by providing a centrally integrated forum for the exchange of new concepts, methods, and results from prevention research and related public health fields, and by providing a forum for the communication between scientists, public policy leaders, and practitioners concerning the implementation of evidence-based preventive interventions in all areas of public health. The theme of this year's conference, Why Context Matters, towards a place-based prevention science is especially relevant during these extraordinary times. The theme is intended to challenge prevention scientists to explicitly recognize the central role that geographical concepts such as location, distance, distribution, connectivity, place, neighborhood, and activity space have on health outcomes. A place-based approach to prevention science recognizes that risk and protective factors are spatially differentiated and that health disparities and culture variations between neighborhoods, regions, and countries are magnified in particular places. For those of you who are new to SPR, we are pleased that you can join us for all or part of our virtual meeting. It is a great opportunity to learn more about SPR. SPR is dedicated to advancing scientific investigation on the etiology and prevention of social, physical, and mental health and academic problems and the translation of that information to promote health and well-being. The multidisciplinary membership of SPR is international and includes scientists, practitioners, advocates, administrators, and policymakers who value the conduct and dissemination of prevention science worldwide. Finally, I'd like to express sincere thanks for the generous support of the National Institutes of Health. Funding for the virtual conference was made possible in part by an NIH-funded R13 grant. I'd also want to acknowledge and thank Michael Mason, the 2020 conference chair, and the network of people who have volunteered their time and shaped this year's agenda. I hope you enjoy this virtual conference. Please visit preventionresearch.org to see all of the sessions we have planned for you over the next three days. Thank you for joining us despite these unprecedented times. Please stay safe and healthy, and I look forward to seeing you in DC June 1st of next year. Take care. Thank you, Willie. Welcome everyone. My name is Michael Mason. This is the first presentation, the Society for Prevention Research Annual Meeting 2020, Why Context Matters Towards a Place-Based Prevention Science. We're very excited about this conference. We acknowledge the irony of a virtual conference for a place-based theme, but we will carry on. An important book that came out a few years ago entitled Neighborhoods and Health, um, edited by Duncan and Kawachi, includes a really important and interesting introduction by the internationally recognized scholar, Ana Diaz-Ruz, who describes in five pages the history and the complexity, the current challenges of this area of study, which is relatively new in some regards. She covers six areas 
And I'm going to skip to number five, where she talks about the complexity of the theoretical and methodological approaches and the sophistication that is needed to address these complex dynamics. So number one, it's complex. And number two, the way forward to address these big problems is to integrate multiple sources of evidence. So that's what we're doing today. Multiple disciplines coming together, edging towards consilience, that unity of knowledge, trying to solve public health issues. Our first panel represents that theme, understanding neighborhood effects through geography, architecture, and addiction science. We have three excellent presenters that we're excited about. Our first speaker will be Dr. Maypo Kwan, whose talk is entitled The Neighborhood Effect Averaging Problem, the Elusive Confounder of Neighborhood Effect. Dr. Kwan is the Cho Ming Ling Professor of Geography and Resource Management and the Director of the Institute of Space and Earth Information Science at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, where she is right now. Thank you, Mei Po. And she is a fellow at the United Kingdom's Academy of Social Science. Our next speaker is Professor Joanna Lombard, who will present Greening, Miami-Dade, an intervention study. Professor Lombard is an architecture and professor in the School of Architecture at the University of Miami with a joint appointment in the Department of Public Health Sciences, the Miller School of Medicine. And finally, we're pleased to have Dr. David Epstein who will present Recalculating Root, Lessons Learned About Using Place-Based Prevention in Addiction. Dr. Epstein is a tenure-track investigator at NIDA's Intramural Research Program in Baltimore, where he works in the real-world assessment, prediction, and treatment unit. So each speaker will have 15 minutes, and we'll have 15 minutes of discussion at the end. And with that, we will begin with Dr. Kwan's presentation. Thank you uh, for the kind introduction and very happy to join this uh, plenary. Next. So a lot of interest has been placed on the environmental exposure and health. So neighborhood effects and also environmental exposures are known to be important for health outcomes. WHO say where you live matters to health outcomes. Uh, so whether there's physical activities uh, facilities, uh, supermarkets, and fast food restaurants are important. However, just like Anna said, uh, oh my God, uh, it's really complicated. Uh, next. So we can look into uh, building environmental exposure model, monitoring uh, to models, for example, land use uh, models for air pollution or the 3D exposure models uh, for radio frequency electric magnetic fields. However, the linking the models to the actual behavior, health behavior, and also the health effects are proven to be much more complicated. Next. So when we're talking about what is in the environment that we are focused on, I think in the literature, very commonly, we're talking about the natural environment, the built environment, and also the social environment. Uh, natural can be the green space, blue space, the builds can be walkability, the social environment can be, uh, you know, depredation, social depredation. Uh, what is important is the environment contributes to about 70% of the world's chronic disease burden. That means uh, since most of this environment can be modified or adjusted by policy, that means that it has a big implication for prevention research. Next. Uh, so, and uh, obviously how to delineate neighborhood or define neighborhood is a very important uh, uh, in, uh, in this. And it's all also complicated by human mobility. For example, this is Lexington, Kentucky. And the third dimension is seven days in terms of time. And people are moving around every 10 seconds. And then it's, uh, and then uh, next, we can intersect the environment however we are delineated in space and time uh, in any way, because now we have the geospatial technology. Next. 
For example, we can think about the green uh, layers as green space. Uh, so this is what we call the spatial uh, turn in the health research. Next. However, as I have said, uh, the uncertainty in terms of geographic is very uh, geographic context is really complicated. And the uncertain geographic context problem articulated by me in 2012 is talking about the findings about the effects of area-based attributes on individual behaviors of outcome could be affected by how contextual units or neighborhoods are geographically delineated. Uh, for example, what we usually work is uh, where, you know, somebody's residence and we draw, you know, like a, a circle around it to be the neighborhood or using the census tract uh, unit, which is very static and administrative uh, unit. And so that may not have any relevance uh, or causally relevant to the health outcome. So temporally, can, for example, cancer doesn't develop in one day. So it also may affect, you know, if we're just looking into the real time, uh, geographic context, it may not be, you know, capturing all the effects. So the problem arises when there's a spatial uncertainty. So we don't capture the spatial unit correctly in the actual area that exert contextual influences on the individual uh, being studied, and also the temporal uncertainty, which is uh, highly complex in terms of the timing and duration in which uh, individuals experience these contextual influences. Next. Next, please, yeah. So look at this, you know, like, so uh, fo focus on the peer study, largely on the home. Next. Uh, and, but however, people move around in a day in different times, doing different kinds of activities. Next. So that means that the static, uh, assuming people only look into the residential neighborhood, but um, ignoring the non-residential neighborhood can be erroneous. Uh, and also, I also want to talk about a special form of the uncertain geographic context problem, which is the neighborhood effect averaging problem. And that is actually looking into mainly the mobility dependent exposure and if that is mobility dependent and uh, dependent, and we are ignoring the human daily mobility, that we also, again, the assessment can be erroneous. And also, because it does not fully address, there's a neighborhood effect averaging. Next. Uh, this is a website uh, that uh, I explained, uh, the, uh, the NIP, what this one I call. Next. And some of the papers that you can uh, dig more deeper if you're interested. Next. So this is a problem that of, about individual mobility based exposure tend towards the mean level of the participant or population of a study area when compared to the residence based exposure. When people are not moving and it's not mobility dependent, so maybe it's okay. But if people are moving and then they may tend to go to, you know, like other places. For example, the daily mobility may amplify because when you're in a low exposure uh, places and they may be highly likely to go to a high exposure places. And then the other way around, when people are located in a high exposure neighborhood, they may tend to attenuate the exposure they experience in the residential neighborhood. Eventually, that may come to, you know, like uh, the you know, like over uh, estimating uh, the uh, statistical significance and the effect size of the neighborhood effect. Next. Next, please. Yeah. So then that means that taking into people's uh, daily, uh, uh, you know, like uh, mobility, that is a uh, really important. And then uh, the health outcome that are affected by the exposure in the non-residential neighborhood as they move around also come into uh, the way and also will uh, make it, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like important uh, for estimation of the statistical significance. Uh, next. Next, please. Yeah. So uh, graphically, uh, again, when uh, next, when people are in a lower exposure level and they tend to amplify upward averaging. Next. On the other hand, the high exposure level residents uh, in the place that is high exposure, and then when they move around, they tend to attenuate, attenuate, uh, downward uh, averaging. Next. 
and eventually come up to you know the average. Next. So empirical, empirically, not my paper, but uh, other people also found using big data, mobile phone data, uh, and then uh, the pink is uh, is more towards uh, the dynamic using mobility dynamic uh, measurement, and they they have a uh, more towards the mean, and whereas the blue is more uh, and, and less uh, that is uh, based on the static, which is based on the residence uh, measurement only. Next, and in another paper also. Uh, empirically, found that in multiple air pollutants, and then they uh, the uh, you know the uh, resident space only measure overestimate or underestimate uh, the uh, exposure, and the red is the over uh, underestimate, and the blue is the overestimation. Next. So, and this is uh, again to summarize is that. If we ignore, you know, the, uh, the neighborhood event averaging, then may, we may overestimate the statistical significance. And then uh, next, please, yeah. Uh, so, and then I would like to pause and think about then, uh, well, I mean, so far what we say is uh, if that is a neighborhood event averaging, everything is towards a mean, then, well, I mean, neighborhood effects is uh, kind of minimal, uh, however, I want to qualify that this is only related to mobility based uh, uh, mobility based uh, mobility dependent exposure and also not everybody is experiencing uh, the same kind of a uh, neighborhood effect averaging for example when there's a high exposure for negative exposure like pollutants or social depredation people are may not necessarily not everybody can move around and just over a lesser that disadvantage. So in the Kim and Kwan paper 2020 published in the annals of AAG, and then we ask the question, first of all, does it exist, right? Does NIP exist? But the second question is also, then who in particular are more affected by the NIP? That means that who are actually not be able to uh, average, you know, for example, uh, that disadvantage. So this is related to the environmental justice uh, question. So for example, uh, uh, one uh, easy uh, thinking would be if people are immobile, they just cannot move around, they just stay at home all day, and that those people would not experience any need. Uh, next. So we have a study in Los Angeles, next, using, uh, next, yeah, the net, uh, uh, looking into ozone uh, exposure and then uh, using a national household travel surveys. Uh, and then we are uh, looking into a subsample of about 2,700 people. Next. Uh, and then, uh, so this is how the diary looks like. People move around, home, work, work, home, home, go to the gym, gym, go shopping, shopping back home. Uh, so on the right-hand side, the ozone has different layers of a uh, uh, you know, the like different levels uh, varying by the different hours of time. And then the person which is in the black uh, in the time only stay at home. However, next, next, uh, when they're moving around, then it's uh, really uh, like uh, uh, exposing to different kind of uh, exposure. So, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. I mean, I, uh, so uh, the black is at home, but and then when they're moving around, they're also uh, matching to a different kinds of uh, exposure to ozone. Next. And then so uh, there's averaging, the uh, red color is uh, the mobility-based measures, more towards the mean, yeah. Next. So we are asking then uh, who, uh, whose estimated exposure are, more, are most affected? So we, we use a spatial regression analysis, a spatial error model. Next. And then we have different kinds of variable, age, male, children, immigrants, and uh, different kinds of models. And then our finding is uh, next. So mostly it's the younger male employed and high income participants when compared to the low income, non-working, older, and female participants are associated with high level of neighborhood effect averaging. That means that they are more related. Uh, they, they are more, you know, like... Uh, uh, be able to, you know, be uh, going towards the mean. Next. Um, next. And then, uh, then we ask the question, is this uh, young male employee and high income in Los Angeles 
have a higher level of daily mobility. And then we find out that a high level of daily mobility is also significant associated with a higher degree of uh, neighborhood effect uh, averaging. Next. So uh, then the so what does it mean? It means that you know like and then the elderly, uh, the old age and uh, and the unemployed and also low income and uh, female are less likely to be averaging the disadvantage uh, of ozone when they're moving around. So in the conclusion, uh, so when we are looking into uncertainty exists and the need, you know, can lead to erroneous uh, results for mobility dependent uh, exposure. The accurate delineation of geographic context and space and time is important for establishing the causal relationship between the environment and health. And then we ask the question, then who can overcome, you know, uh, you know by averaging their disadvantages? And then uh, when we increase mobility, uh, that the different social groups, right? And some groups, when we increase the mobility, may, maybe we will increase the uh, averaging uh, effect for them to lesser the disadvantage. However, you know, just uh, like uh, Robert Sampson and others have talked about, and they use also big data to look at 52 uh, states, you know, in the United States, and then the minority African American low income, when they are moving far and wide, they are not going to the white and uh, also high income neighborhood. So their, their exposure, the social interaction may not be meaningful. So just increasing the mobility may not be the only, you know, like um, that uh, may not uh, solve all the problems. For vulnerable social groups, the effect of mobility on the environment, environmental influence, tend to operate in the opposite direction as expected in other social groups. So we need very explicit social policies and interventions to address inequality and integration. Uh, so I finish my uh, conclusion and thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. We're going to move ahead, and our second speaker is Professor Joanna Lombard, Greening Miami Dade and Intervention Study. Take it away, Joanna. Thank you, Michael. Um, I thought I would share with you the people and the background, and then speak about three examples of intervention and uh, close with kind of our current work. So, on the slide, you'll see our the founder of our interdisciplinary program, Jose Shaposhnik, Liz plater Zyberg, who's an architect, Maria Nardi in the center of the slide is the direct, current director of parks, but when she first joined us, she was a deputy director and she's a graduate of the University of Miami School of Architecture. She'd gotten a landscape degree at Harvard, came back to Miami to really uh, look into kind of community and neighborhood. And then Scott Brown, who is a PI on the studies I'm gonna show you. So the next slide gives you a sense of the conditions in Miami. We started out doing very on the ground studies. We looked at uh, 2,800 school-aged children in one of Miami's poorest neighborhoods in East Havana, and we discovered something um, that in these neighborhoods that we were examining, although the socioeconomic status and the ethnicity was relatively constant, what changed were the variables of the built environment, the way the buildings meet the street, whether there were trees, whether there were not trees, whether there were socially supportive features. So this led us after coding something like 3,800 blocks uh, or 403 blocks and 3,800 properties, we looked at 273 elders on the blocks. And in each case, we found benefits associated with socially supported features. This led us to look at uh, 400 Cuban immigrants who had come to Miami and were placed basically by social services or previous family arrangements all across Dade County. And we were able to look at their health outcomes in relation to their neighborhoods. And having stepped back and taken this view, this led us to the next slide where you'll see the study that we did with 250,000 Miami-Dade Medicare beneficiaries looking at 36,000 census blocks. And we were able to look at their health outcomes in relation to greenness in the block level of our resident. And we looked at the used NDVI, which is um, most of you probably know a satellite normalized different vegetation index. And we looked, and you can see in the next slide, some of the outcomes of this study where 
we found looking, um, comparing our health conditions of those living on blocks with one standard deviation below to one standard deviation above the mean in terms of greenness, those in our lowest income areas, and in Miami, the low income areas would be less than $31,000 a year, or our medium income areas, which would be between 31 and 62,000, that our Medicare beneficiaries, 65 and older, for those living on the highest greenness blocks compared with those living on the lowest greenness blocks were reductions in hyperlipidemia of 10%, hypertension of 13%, and diabetes in 14%. So in the next slide, we you step back and say, well, 49 fewer chronic conditions per 1,000 individuals is relatively equivalent to a three-year reduction of biomedical aging in that population. So we started to dig a little deeper. In the next slide, you'll see some of the post hoc analysis where we began to look at heart disease, depression, Alzheimer's, and we found even stronger associations with block level greenness. Um, and we're working right now on a paper on our stroke findings where you see a 20% reduction in stroke. So understanding all of this, we took a look at something that was happening simultaneous. So in the next slide, you'll see where Maria Nardi's work on the Miami-Dade County Parks and Open Space Master Plan was taking place um, and was approved by the county just at the outset of the HUD study that I just showed you. And in that work, Maria and Jack, Maria was deputy director, Jack Cardis was the director of parks, and they were on our research team. And they had put out there the idea that parks should start at your door, that greenness of streets and streetscapes would make a difference in the community. And linking our community through greenways would be an important strategy for the future. And obviously this becomes a foundation for resilience later. But what you can see in this is, so one of the first things we did is to look at, if you look in this diagram, you'll see a green area, which is Gwen Cherry Park. And above Gwen Cherry Park, you see a red rectangle that is one of the uh, Juanita Man. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> That's the Frederica Wilson and Juanita Man Health Center. And one of the first ideas was that in the greening of the streets, we could also focus on greenness interconnecting parks with our federally um, qualified health centers as a public health initiative. The second kind of project that grew out of this too. So this was with the Parks Department and the University of Miami. The next slide shows you a project that was initiated in the county, which is the Million Trees Miami. And this was greening, particularly in low-income neighborhoods, a significant greening program. And this one is actually the foundation of our uh, Robert Wood Johnson study because between the time of our first measurement, 2010, which was the HUD study, and 2016, the county planted over 200,000 trees in primarily low income areas. And then the next slide takes you um, into the present, which is a, a kind of new alliance, which is taking resilience, green infrastructure. I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard of it. The National Recreation and Parks Association has advanced an initiative on this as well. But this was a project done, um, we consulted with the Van Allen Institute. They had a competition. Two UM students, Andrew Arquad and Isaac Stein, participated and won this competition with their colleagues, Maggie um, Sang and artist Adler Guerrier, Guerrier. And you've heard of vacant, um, greening of vacant lots that's taking place around the country. So my, this is a kind of Miami version where the greening of the vacant lot actually becomes a stormwater retention lot so that the low-lying area flooding can be absorbed in this particular lot. So it gets the multiple benefits of greening as well as climate resilience. So this is the foundation for the current work we're doing, which you'll see in the next slide, which is our study with Robert Wood Johnson, where we went back to look at our original Medicare beneficiaries, and we're looking at the blocks that were low greenness and stayed low, and low greenness that became high greenness, and those that were in high greenness and stayed high. And we're focusing on our low income neighborhoods because the effects of greenness on health outcomes was about 50% stronger in our low income neighborhoods. And the next map you'll see, the next slide you'll see, shows you some of the greenness from 2011 to 2016. So if you um, know Miami at all, you can see the island uh, up to the top of the slide, there's Miami Beach is off to the right. Exactly, and that's North Miami Beach. And if you travel a little further south down, Michael, you're doing a great job with this. 
over perfect. So directly across from that on the left hand side or to the west is downtown Miami. And if you compare that area of downtown Miami and the low income neighborhoods to the north and to the west, you'll see that significant greening has taken place over time. And so this gives us an opportunity to really stop and, and take a measurement of how this greening, greening initiatives may have impacted our 2010 Medicare beneficiaries. And then our current project is in the next slide, which is we were just awarded uh, funding in July to explore greening impacts on a new cohort. These are um, the participants of the HCHS Soul Study, and we'll be following about 8,000 people, 4,000 in Miami, 4,000 in San Diego, and we'll be looking at block level greenness in relation to chronic health conditions. And our next slide shows you the study model for this, where we're gonna look at the impact of cumulative greenness exposure on cardiometabolic health outcomes mediated by waist circumference, insulin resistance, and inflammation. And we're also looking at behavior pathways such as physical activity for part of this sample. And so I um, wanted to, I've tried to be pretty brief with this one, so I've given you a kind of flyover of the activities, but I wanted to close. The last slide gives you an image of a tree planting that took place in a literally pop-up park and um, this particular tree is a native to Florida. It's the strangler fig. And what, you, what we've discovered is that the kind of greening work and studying these interventions and creating the inter interdisciplinary team that Jose really pioneered almost 20 years ago, bringing people into the team who are from the government agencies who are active in the interventions in the community, has been a really eye-opening experience for us. And the, the kind of closing point about that is the idea of building capacity so that evidence-based, um, uh, there's a capacity for evidence-based decision-making at the level of policy and action. So while there are projects going on, talking to, for example, Kat Teal, who's got a Robert Wood Johnson project in New Orleans, working at Tulane on greening vacant lots, um, Aruni Batnagar's work in Louisville is another example. One of the things that we are finding in general is that by bringing people into the research teams at the table for the design of the study, at the table for the analysis and discussion on results, we have the opportunity to really engage and seed in the various departments around the cities and counties people who are asking these questions in their daily work. So for example, to think about the tree planting and right-of-ways that I've been talking about, that's not a simple matter. That engages parks, it engages transportation, public works, and water and sewer. And in some parts of the country, water and sewer are actually different departments. So we have all these people in all these different agencies trying to do good, but their focus has tended to be conventionally on the thing itself, the pipe, the road. And what happens when we embrace this group into this world of research, there's a kind of transformation that takes place where we realize the reason we do all this is to enhance the health and well-being of the people in our communities. And so the capacity for transformation that grows through this process of engagement, I think we find that as important as the results that we're finding in the studies themselves. So I thank you for your attention on this, and Michael, thank you. All right, thank you, Professor Lombard. Our next speaker will be David Epstein, who's talking about recalculating root lessons learned about using place-based prevention in addiction. Go ahead, David. Thank you. Um, I chose my title, Recalculating Root. I chose my title because what I want to try to do is show you basically where I'm making some adjustments to the way that I think, the way that I, that I think about using place in addiction research. And those adjustments are really, they're still in progress. You're gonna hear a couple of stories that don't really have endings yet. And also in some respects, they're just my stories. Uh, my colleagues and my trainees, have really sharp independent minds and highly varied backgrounds. We're a team that has interdisciplin interdisciplinary collaboration built right into it. Um, and everyone on my team has at least a slightly different take on our work than I do and slightly different from each other, which is a strength for us. We do better work because we challenge each other's assumptions and we really listen to each other. 
Um, but to be fair to them, I want you to know that the next 15 minutes or so is going to be devoted basically to what I think. The credit for the work goes to my team. None of this would be possible without them. But if you take exceptions to the ways that I discuss the work, that's on me. All right, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to tell two stories very briefly, very quickly. Uh, one of them, one about using GPS data at the level of the individual person, and one about using the same kind of data at the population level. And then I'll tell you where we're headed from here. Next slide, please. Uh, all of this is work that we've been doing since around 2009. We have a treatment research clinic, uh, as shown here, on the east side of Baltimore. We enroll people with opioid use disorder and cocaine use disorder. We give them treatment and we lend them smartphones with an app on which they report their moods and their activities in real time throughout the day, usually for several months at a time. And we're also logging their geolocation with GPS throughout that. We've collected these kinds of data on well over 300 people over the years. Uh, we're all in telework mode now. We have been since March, so we're not actively collecting these kind of data right now but we have a lot of archive data and we're working intensively with those archive data so that our next rounds of data collection can address what we learn from the data we have. Um, one overarching concern that I wanna cover in these 15 minutes is, next slide, thank you, uh, is what should we do with effects or relationships that are each very small on their own as effects in the behavioral sciences tend to be? And this is going to play out differently at the two different levels that I want to talk about, the individual level and the population level. Next slide. Um, our work with individual prediction and prevention, it basically falls into the realm of developing what are called just-in-time interventions, which have been kind of a hot topic in mobile health. And what's on screen is just two examples of recent reviews of that topic. Um, the idea of, of these JIDIs is to use individual moment-by-moment -moment data to automatically detect or predict moments of risk with the eventual goal of intervening on the spot. And for this kind of detection or prediction, the measure of success is accuracy. It's not about p-values, it's about your rates of true and false positives and true and false negatives. Uh, next slide. We know that the things that we're looking for in terms of place are very subtle. We've done some geonarrative interviews of the kind that were actually developed by Maypo. We didn't even end up publishing our geonarrative interviews because the main thing we learned from them is that any kind of momentary relationship between place and drug-related feelings or behaviors were largely invisible to the people we interviewed. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Uh, even so, when we take the mountains and mountains of data that we have and we train machine learning models with those data, we can predict drug craving and other mental events like stress and mood 90 minutes into the future using GPS tracks. I know you can't make out the details on the slide, and I'm not zooming in. I have to keep this talk more high level than that in the time I have. Um, the models that we used here in this, in this paper, we ran them on data we'd already collected. Basically, we simulated what a prediction app would do if it were running live on someone's smartphone. And the inputs to the models included person-level demographic information, but the only real momentary input to the models, the only input that changed from moment to moment, was information about what kinds of neighborhoods the person had been moving through for the past few hours. And I'll tell you more in a few minutes about how we coded that. Um, when we published this, my argument in the paper was that the, our prediction accuracy was not good enough yet to be used for prevention. That's only a judgment. It might be too harsh. It's really an empirical question, but that's where I stand from now, for now. And it is a slightly contrarian stance because our accuracy, our prediction accuracy for craving and stress and so on, it was about as good as anyone else's accuracy who's been publishing in this field. And most other people, when they do this, they augment their GPS inputs with other kinds of sens sensor data from the phone. In other words, you can collect all kinds of passive data that's not burdensome on people from a smartphone, and you'll predict behavior only about as well as we did using just GPS data. And we still want to do better than that. And if we want to do better than that, the question is, how much self-report do we have to collect? How much does our app need to bug people with questions all day about how they're feeling to make good predictions about what they're gonna do next? And we are designing a study to examine that. Um, next slide, please. 
A related set of issues is that when we detect a moment of risk, we want to intervene. We want to deliver some kind of content right on the spot. Now, one of the themes of this plenary session is the importance of working across disciplines. And this is a place where that's going to be crucial. I had a protocol that I thought was ready to start in which we were going to use what's called a micro randomized design, which would let us examine how app delivered messages reflecting different psychotherapeutic approaches might be differentially matched to real world situations. Next slide, please sometimes called strategy situation fit. For example, a CBT-based message, cognitive behavioral therapy, might be best for one time and place. And a very different kind of like mindfulness-based mindfulness message might be better for another time and place. And what happened was in February, after extensive discussions with people who have real psychotherapeutic expertise that I don't have, including the postdoc I brought on to implement this protocol, I decided the best thing we could do for now was shelve the protocol for now. And that's partly because, next slide please, because we don't know enough, and I mean no one knows enough, to turn any existent therapeutic materials into little bite-sized bits of content that can be delivered out of sequence wherever, wherever and whenever the person happens to need something. We can do other great things with treatment apps, but if we're gonna make claims about delivering content in a really context specific way, we have a lot of formative work to do, which we've started to do. Our group has started to do it. I'll say a little more about that uh, at the end. But that's one broad respect in which our group is recalculating root. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, the, other, the other level on which we use our geospatial data is to make population level inferences. And again, this is a story of small effects and small relationships, but now we're in the realm of inferential statistics, the kind with p-values. And as you probably know, biostatisticians are now pushing back pretty hard against focusing just on p-values when you do that kind of statistics. Uh, st statisticians are saying we need to focus on the size of the effect, the pre precision with which we've estimated it, and this is the really hard part, whether the effect is big enough to matter or small enough to ignore. Uh, next slide again. Um, the first thing that we published from our geographical data, and this is a pilot study with just 27 people, we included, it included an effect that we felt at least was counterintuitive in which basically people felt worse than we thought they would or worse than I thought they would in seemingly pleasant looking neighborhoods and better than we thought they would in seemingly disorderly looking neighborhoods. By the way, this is uh, only looking at moments when they're not at home. This is all about where they go, not where they live. Um, in the paper, we speculate about what might have caused this, this sort of counterintuitive relationship between where people are and how they feel. Um, after we published it, we followed up uh, with data from, uh, uh, it turned out to be 178 more participants, enough people so that now we could control for things like sex and age and race. Uh, next slide. Um, and our former postdoc, Bill Kowalczyk, was doing exactly that, controlling for those things, when he noticed what looked like a race difference. Next slide. Um, so the counterintuitive, or what I think is the counterintuitive effect that we'd seen, the relationship between where you are and how you feel, it seemed like it was occurring only in our European American participants, not in our African American participants. As soon as we tried to look deeper into this, we realized that the, environment or the environmental measure that we're using had a limitation that was gonna stand in our way. Next slide, please. And until then, I always felt that our environmental measure was perfect for our purposes. By the way, I think Deborah Fur Holden, who developed this, is watching. Hello, Deborah. I love this measure. It's an objective observer rated set of scores that basically shows what each block face in Baltimore looked like to the naked eye. And I used to boast that this was far better than any kind of like census derived data that we could use because when people are walking around like our participants are, they respond to what they can literally see and hear. And this measure gives us exactly that as rated by objective observers. The problem for us was that this measure was designed specifically for city block faces. As soon as our participants tracks went from Baltimore City to Baltimore County, we had to delete that track from our analyses because our exposure measure didn't apply to it. 
Not surprisingly, this happened a lot more with our European American participants than with our African American participants. So next slide, please. To deal with that, our geospatial data scientist, Matt Tabersky, came up with what I still consider a brilliant idea, which was to use tax valuation data, property tax data, that would essentially create a wall-to-wall -wall map of the whole state, potentially the whole country, that would be like a proxy for how desirable or not desirable a given place was. There's a lot of complications to working with these data, like the fact that they're broken into many different types of land use. It took like literally a couple of years of hard work on Matt's part to make these data usable for us. And so, uh, next slide, please. Just a few weeks ago, I emailed Matt with this. This is a preprint paper that made headlines in the Washington Post, and it seems to show that our quasi-universal score for place has a race disparity baked right into it. I don't have to tell you what a disgrace this is on a moral level. We can probably treat that part of it as a given. What's not a given, or wasn't a given when, when we first saw this, is is this a showstopper for using these data the way we'd hope to use them? We look closely, we determine that we don't think it is, we think the disparity, we don't think it's large enough or introduces so much noise into the data that we can't make valid inferences. But I present it here because I think it's an interesting lesson in how if you're doing place-based research, you always need to be alert for developments that might affect your strategies for coding place data. Things that might seem to be neutral can turn out not to be as neutral as you thought. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, next slide. Um, in any case, we did uh, use the tax value data. Uh, uh, no, go back. Go back one. We did use the tax value data to follow up what we thought was our race-related findings. The difference we found was very subtle. It was rarely statistically significant. It was kind of now you see it, now you don't. And in fact, now you don't see it because I'm not showing it. I don't mind showing unpublished data in general, but I'm hanging on to these for now because they raise questions that I think resonate with a lot of other parts of this year's conference. Like what is the most responsible way to present and interpret findings about these kind of disparities? When you study place in the United States, you almost inevitably study race and you're gonna find things that might seem relevant to racial justice. They're gonna be, sometimes they're gonna be small or have wide confidence intervals. And those kind of things are always hard to know how to present well. And in this context, they're going to be even more fraught. Um, okay, next slide now. I'm running slower than I thought I would or longer than I thought I would. In the small amount of time I have left, I'll give a few notes on where our group is going from here. Um, next slide. Thank you. Uh, I've mentioned our machine learning and geospatial expert, Matt. Among many other things, he's been examining different ways that our prediction models can incorporate more momentary inputs that are not GPS-based, which requires coding self-report data that have really unruly or sparse distributions, and that is a whole different talk. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, no, back on. Back one, back on Albert. Uh, our postdoc, Albert Burgess Hall, he's designed a study that's gonna examine how dense and burdensome our self-report prompts, our self-report data have to be to give us better inputs for our predictive models. And meanwhile, with the GPS data that we have, Albert is bringing in a, a more literally geospatial approach to coding it. Up till now, we've coded our GPS data in terms of where people, what people are exposed to along their tracks. We haven't literally looked at the size and the shape of their tracks, their activity space. One of the next questions I'd like us to address, which is an open question in the literature, is whether people can be sorted into different types, like basically homebodies versus explorers, or whether those things are more smoothly distributed. And if we can, uh, if we can describe changes in activity spaces better, that should improve both our individual prediction models and our population level inferences. And um, uh, next slide. Almost done. Um, our postdoc, Kirsten Smith, her doctorate is in social work. She's been doing in-depth interviews to get us the kind of information that you just can't get from multiple choice items on a smartphone screen. And one of our initial takeaways from that work is that our, our participants describe lapses to drug use. They say there quickly comes a point of no return when their mind is made up. And if your momentary intervention doesn't come before that moment, forget about it. It's not going to work. Now, that's only their perception. People's insight into what they're going to do isn't always perfect. But if it's true, it raises a paradox that if you do prevention very well, it might be difficult to demonstrate that you did it because your greatest success rate might be for risk moments that the person never even recognizes as risk moments. Uh, the more you succeed at each individual time or place for each person, the more you're going to need to zoom out to the group level data to find the evidence for your success. OK, uh, next slide. All right. Uh, I, I, I've been speeding us around to a lot of different places. Uh, if I can reduce it to a takeaway, this is it. As important as place is, we have not found a way to make it a really robust predictor of mentation or behavior from moment to moment. 
And the individual level implication of that is if you want to make a mobile health app that accurately predicts craving or lapse, GPS might not be enough of an input even with other passive data. I think you have to do what I was hoping we could mostly avoid doing, which is repeatedly ask people to make self-reports. That's an empirical question. I have smart colleagues who disagree with me. We may be doing better than I think we are. And there's a population level implication. Like I said, large GPS data sets are likely to offer findings that have small effect sizes and provocative implications. And it's gonna be difficult to report and interpret those findings responsibly. Okay, last slide. And pardon me for taking more like 16 minutes. With that, I'd like to thank my colleagues and my mentees, especially my longtime mentor, Kenzie Preston. She's the one who got our ambulatory assessment work off the ground. It wouldn't have happened without her. And with that, I am happy to give up the floor. And I'm sorry I took an extra minute and a half. <laughs> Thank you, David. That was great. <laughs> so we have some questions that I can direct to some of the panelists. Um, I think the first one is for Dr. Kwan. Um, yes. Yeah. So I read the question from the private chat. Uh, so we are talking about uh, you know racism on health and how is racism both uh, mobility dependent and not mobility dependent can we separate out the effect do we need to uh, so I think that based, uh, this is a great question I think uh, so I touch upon in my uh, talk a little bit because it's a 15 minutes talk uh, but racism is uh, very important uh, so a lot of uh, visualized experience actually related to mobility or immobility. So we see that, you know, like this lack of bus route and then there's a food desert in uh, African-American, you know, neighborhoods. And that is highly related to uh, not good health. So if uh, so, this is a highly mobility dependent. However, I also mentioned that sometimes, you know, like in some mobility studies, we look into some uh, minority, like African American, Hispanic Americans, they move far and wide. So the mobility is not, uh, you know, in terms of all kinds of measures, like physical distance is not a matter. However, uh, they still encounter racism, you know, in where they go. So that means that they may try to avoid uh, interacting with the white uh, and also high income people because there's explicit racism being an Asian American <laughs> myself. So I experienced quite a lot of those. Uh, so I think that there's, uh, so sometimes it's, uh, uh, so even overcome the mobility uh, question may not uh, necessarily help. And it's important. Uh, I think that the last question can be separate out the effect. I think uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we can especially, you know, like collect data and look at data on different subgroups that is mobility, low mobility, uh, you know, ethnic, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like uh, maybe minority uh, uh, people and then versus, you know, the other, uh, other groups of people and then we can do studies on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, a long answer for okay. your question. Mm -hmm. um, Joanna, do you want to um, respond to this question from Deborah? Can I don't know if you see it. It's the lack of greenness should be added. Yes, totally. I yes, I think Deborah is completely right. And um, the question about it as an urban construct, there are studies looking at impacts in rural areas as well. There's um, the famous Ashboro study is one. But there are a number of studies that look at essentially at degrees of greenness and variability of greenness. And those do occur in suburban and rural communities as well. But certainly the urban areas, which is where we are, is what we have studied most closely. Um, and I think there was another one, Michael, did you want me to get um, about the income factor? We did look at, uh, we did control for individual age, sex, race, ethnicity, and neighborhood income. And then there was a question about protective factors, again, controlling for neighborhood income. And as I mentioned, we actually found the, strong, uh, the, the associations were the strongest, 50% stronger in our lowest income areas. So I, I know the caller or the questioner mentioned that Coral Gables and Coconut Grove are very green. But what we found throughout the county are that there are these um, 
in our low income areas are some of the least green and that's where we're finding the strongest associations. When you did find the pockets of green, the outcomes were significantly better. Great, thank you. David, would you like to answer this smartphone lending question? I don't know if everyone sees these questions. I'll just read it off in case, mm -hmm. Dr. Epstein, you lend smartphones, question mark. What are the terms of the lending process? Have you encountered issues having phones broken or returned? Uh, we do, we've done pretty much all our research we've done in people we're treating on our on -site, with our, at our on-site clinic. We're treating initially with methadone maintenance then with buprenorphine maintenance. Uh, so the arrangement we make with them from the start is you'll you'll receive good free treatment and they're not just receiving medication but also counseling and medical attention you'll 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 get free treatment for as long as you agree to be in a research study and we you know we we explain that to them very much up front um, and we also and the way that we always have presented you know when we started doing ambulatory research even before we started tracking geolocation we always presented it to people as this is kind of a chance to make your voice heard. This isn't us spying on you and being big brother with you. This is addiction researchers have made a lot of assumption, uh, assumptions over the years about how addiction works. And we wanna know more about what things are actually like from day to day for you. And this is your chance to, to sort of, you know, to, to help us understand. And people seem to, to that seems to resonate. People seem to, to, to get that. And um, that's, that's how it works. Uh, so, so, so yeah, people are receiving free treatment. They, they receive small incentives for compliance with responding to our randomly prompted, you know, ra randomly prompted data entries. And generally, uh, we get we get good adherence. Great, thank you, David. Um, Joanna, do you want to answer this question from Kathleen? Um, can you please talk about how you engaged and continued? motivating your interdisciplinary team? <laughs> um, well, I guess we're highly motivated by this study and the results and the possibilities of doing good. Um, Miami is, the place is a huge motivator because as anybody who knows anything about sea level rise knows, Miami is highly vulnerable. We are um, at the moment of the COVID crisis, we're concerned about hurricanes. 66% of our county uh, are people who live below a living wage or mm -hmm. earn below a living wage. So the issues here are very present. The University of Miami is a great, um, you know, Willie Prado himself is a leader in this interdisciplinary field. Jose started our group. It just seemed natural to reach out to people in county government. We try to always work through community partners, so we're not parachuting in as researchers, but we're supporting the community partners in the work they do. I work on a climate adaptation team. Um, it's, it's just, I guess, in the DNA of what we do. I do have a question for David, though. Are we allowed to ask questions, Michael? I think it's okay, yes. Well, so I was just wondering how green your clinics are, where you're, because there's such a huge body of research on greenness in healthcare. And I was wondering, like, um, when I was thinking about our federally qualified health centers and the greening and the relation to parks, like, have you mapped them and what do they look like and how green are they? Um, that's part of when we use the the the, the nifty the, the the initial yeah. type of exposure. Yeah. Now I had hoped to see much much greater effects of how and that sort of that plays into the the score that we use for the nifty. Actually, uh -huh. I don't think it's, it's I don't think it end, the score as we operationalized it. I don't know that it has that, but uh, but it is one of the items that's rated. I had really hoped at the, at the outset that activity space and moving through green pleasant looking areas would have clearer effects than it does, clearer associations with mm -hmm. state of mind. And, and did you separate greenness from the uh, what you called the pleasant aesthetic categories? Like, did you look at just pure greenness? We didn't, okay, we didn't, well, actually we did, We uh, I have looked at a, a bunch of specific items from from that nifty, from that measure. And okay. I'm, I'm sure that was one of them though it's been a few okay. years. And I don't think I found anything. It's all just, it's just way more subtle than, than one would hope it would be. <laughs> So we do uh, just uh, add one thing that is that uh, 
we do have a lot of studies, you know, on greenness and also okay. how does it relate to social health. And we yeah. use uh, remote sensing and also uh, all kinds of uh, measurements uh, on the greenness. So if you're interested in some of, oh, by the way, I forgot about one important thing is that we define activity space in a particular way and, and also varying a different activity space uh, using geographic information uh, system. Yeah. So if you're interested in some of those papers, yeah, I'll be happy to send them to you. Great. Well, I think that's our last question. And I'd like to thank the panelists for all your work and joining us and Dr. Kwan for staying awake. It's midnight. <laughs> I'm quite awake. <laughs> She's going to be standing Drink a lot first. of tea. <laughs> I know uh, when I'm talking about my papers, I'm very energetic. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> Just joking. Okay, great. And thank you, SPR Nation, and everybody who joined us online. We appreciate it. And that's a wrap. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for organizing. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, oh, yeah. Thank you. Bye. Great. Bye. Bye. -bye.